What's going on, everybody? Eric Lindquist at Stochastic here on the Odd Chopper channel, coming to you with another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and notification bell as we get going. Goes a long way for me on this video. Goes a long way for you because you become a prize for whatever great content goes live here at the Odd Chopper channel. It was an awesome weekend, except for the USA soccer team lost. Sad stuff, but hey, we move on. We're talking NBA on these shows anyway, so that's of what it is hopefully you guys still enjoy the rest of the world cup but we are talking basketball and we're talking draft kings i know a ton of you have already signed up over there but if you haven't yet sign up in the video description box below click on that link and you're gonna bet five dollars on any sport and if that bet wins you get 150 bucks so here's the game plan you're gonna bet on gonzaga on monday yeah you heard me they're 15 and a half point favorites against kent state Shout out Kent State. They're going to get murdered, though, by Gonzaga. And that means you put five bucks on the money line there. It won't pay out a whole heck of a lot, but it's going to pay out $150 to play on DraftKings. That is the kind of stuff that you want to be signing up for and taking advantage of on these videos. I'll talk about it a little bit later. But again, $5, bet the Gonzaga money line, and you can just talk all the shit in the entire world. But like legitimately, even if it's one of the biggest upsets in college basketball this season, you're only out $5. So there's really no risk whatsoever to get that 150 bucks. Bet the biggest favorites you can in college basketball, but specifically bet on Gonzaga on Monday night. All righty, y'all. Eight game NBA slate. Uh, we're running hot. We're running wild. Let's get ourselves to the picks. Our first game of the night is a doozy, let me tell you. It's the Clippers taking on the Hornets. And good luck finding a line or props for this one for quite some time because Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are questionable. Yeah, you heard me. The tandem is questionable. I'm actually very curious to see how books gauge the millions of questions and marks. Millions of questions, marks? Million of question, million question marks surrounding this one. And it's not just do they play or don't they play, just kind of like it's can Eric speak English or can he not? If they do play, Ty Lue is one of the worst coaches when it comes to minutes limits and actually divulging information because God forbid, we know what's going on with a professional basketball team before they play as paying fans who probably want to see the best product possible would want to see the best product possible and know what they're getting into before spending their hard earned money on tickets and parking and concessions and so on and so forth. Absolute joke beyond joke. But that's a conversation for a different day. As it stands right now, we know the Clippers with PG-13 and Kawhi are better at basketball than without them. Look at me. Hashtag analysis. As for the Hornets, same situation. They're a worse basketball team with no LaMelo Ball or, <laughs> wild to say it now, Dennis Smith Jr. So point Terry Rozier will continue to be a thing for this team. They've actually found ways to stay competitive. They won three of their past five. Yay! Way to go! But this is certainly a spot you expect them to be dogs. Maybe not massive dogs. I had this number right around three. I would say it could open two and a half or three when it comes out. Uh, and that is assuming that they're both out. That being Kawhi and PG-13. That's kind of where I'm looking at the Clippers as a money line lean. I really don't know what to think about this. If they're good, getting on a plane going to Charlotte from LA, something would tell me they would be more likely to play basketball. But I just don't know with these two cats anymore. With the Clippers not being very straightforward with stuff. I just assume they're along for the ride. Maybe they warm up. Maybe they try to give it a go here. Doesn't feel like stand, making your stand on December 5th in Charlotte is the thing I would expect the most, but two and a half, three, might be able to lay that. Might be looking at a point spread kind of a bet here, but as if, as it stands right now, Clippers money line lean. We'll see what the number looks like tomorrow. All right, we've got a straightforward one here before a wonky game in OKC in Atlanta next. It's the Bucks taking on the Magic down at Disney World. Well, not in Disney World, you know what I mean. And shout out the NBA for quite the game on Friday. The Lakers came out of nowhere, won that game Friday against the Bucks, holy Anthony Davis, and then uh, Sunday against the Wizards, holy Anthony Davis times infinity. Excited to talk about him tomorrow night. But this one shapes up to be a cakewalk with Chris Middleton back in the fold. Giannis, Drew, everybody took a nice little seat on Saturday. Probably a good idea. We'll talk about that in a second. But I like what we saw from the 27 minutes of basketball in Chris Middleton's return Friday. Six of 11 from the field. Three of four from three. Seven assists, which isn't normally his thing. What an upgrade, though, he is to anything else they're rolling out at the three on a nightly basis. Speaking of which, it was Grayson Allen, starting alongside Drew Holiday, Javon Carter. Back in the day here, it's going to be Chris Middleton going forward. He's questionable. Brooke Lopez also questionable. Don't think it has any consequences to the game itself from an outright perspective, but from a prop perspective and the spread, any bump in minutes we can get to our boy Drew Holiday is a plus. 
that lock that I had on Friday, the over of six and a half assists and plus money, that set the tone for a huge weekend, and we're running right back to the well on it on Monday. My man got the night off on Saturday. They beat up on Charlotte anyway without Drew, Middleton, and Giannis. And now Drew is a plus 115 hit on the over here on six and a half assists. Sure, Middleton's going to command the ball in his hands at times, well, a lot more at times, but plus money on this prop for a second straight night, despite a team leading 32.8% assist rate this season, makes me rather intrigued. Think about it this way. Middleton played 27 minutes, got seven assists in that time frame, and still that only equates to a 30.4% assist rate. Tells me it's, it's projecting out rather well with the Drew side of it. And Orlando does slow it down as their 24th in pace. But with a middle-of-the-road defensive efficiency and legit no one I'm concerned about to make this Bucks offense inefficient, give me the over all day and all night at plus money. Hell, I would bet this at even money, so it's just a bonus. That kind of value makes this the first of just two locks on Monday slate. Let's get the weekend started right with holiday. Celebrate. Gonna holiday. Gonna celebrate. I missed the wedding singer. Great flick. Check it out, guys. Drew Holiday over six and a half assists. Lock button. As I said in our last segment, here's another game with absolutely nothing to work with because the question marks are abundant. And not to jinx it, but for once, it's not from the OKC side. Yay, they're completely healthy. Until they just rule people out randomly. But the Hawks didn't have Trey Young on the injury report with that shoulder injury. So my guess is we're just waiting on what the books think about this team and what this spot is going to look like in general without John Collins, without DeAndre Hunter, and inserting Young into this spot against a team in the Thunder that hates, to be honest, about their rotations. We have a lot to work with here. Seriously, aside from Shea Gilders Alexander, everyone's minutes on this team can be, that being the Thunder, of course, can be toyed with in the name of tanking, which is the sole goal of Sam Presti, GM of the Thunder. Uh, that's the sole goal of this team for the 2022-23 season. So yeah, we're obviously leaning on the Hawks money line, just like we leaned the Clippers money line without any other information. But this one I expect to be far more inflated than anything we're looking at from LA, and not remotely close. I think Atlanta comes in north of that two and a half uh, that I'm expecting, or three possibly from the Clippers side. I could see this being six, seven. So quick move along, and if you really want to know my thoughts on this one tomorrow, hit me up on Twitter at Eric Lindquist or... Get access to the premium Discord. Sign up using promo code ELINSIDER. We're having ourselves a blast cashing some tickets. Come try it for free. Yes, one free week using promo code ELINSIDER. And if you don't like it after that, we're not making you money, which I find be implausible the way I'm running of late. Cancel for free after that first week until tomorrow. Atlanta Moneyline, just a lean. Oh, hey guys, check that out. Producer Alicia put it up on the screen. It equates to plus 3000 when you put $5, yes, just $5, over on DraftKings on the Gonzaga money line. Yeah, because that's what happens when you bet $5 and get 150 plus 3000 is something you would never pass up if you knew that Gonzaga was going to be listed at that kind of a money line number. And, I mean, can you blame it? It says plus, uh, minus 2100 You'd have to bet $2,100 to win 100 bucks. Why not just bet five and make that 150 bucks? That's more than you would make betting $2,100 on this play. Think about that. That's crazy. So you'd be crazy not to sign up for DraftKings. At the link below, uh, simply click on it in the video description box below. Click on the link, sign up at DraftKings, and have yourself a good time. I'm not going to sing holiday again. Let's get to the one to the next game. Celtics on the back-to-back -back here, having held the Nets to just 92 points and getting the W on the road Sunday. They'll be facing Toronto and their revamped roster on Monday. Yeah, not revamped as in it's new, but revamped because Pascal Siakam is back and smashing. OG Ananobi and Scotty Barnes are healthy and looking better and better. Aside from Gary Trent's inconsistent play that got him demoted to the bench, this Raptors team is firing on all cylinders and makes this a one difficult matchup to handicap. Again, Boston's at mine uh sorry, Boston's at 18 and 5 with the league's best record, but the back-to-back -back concerns me, and the travel north of the border concerns me, and the overall Raptors defensive intensity concerns me. And yes, even the prospect of someone getting rested on the second leg of a back-to-back -back concerns me. So with the Raptors nearing full strength for the first time in a long time and plus money on the money line, yeah, just ever so slightly, plus 102. That's called plus money. I think we could be looking at a tiny little Toronto money line play. 
you could see that news. I think if unexpected news does drop in this one, it's breaking on the Celtics side. Again, don't get carried away as Boston's been the best team in basketball over the first month and a half of the season. But a small play on the Raptors makes by far the most sense here. That's good enough to qualify for a like, even if it's a meager one, a little baby meager one, like a baby thumbs up. There we go. Plus 102. Hit it up. Friends, I'm going to go on a free Alper and Shangoon rant one of these days. But today is not that day. I'm too damn tired. But it's the Sixers going down to Houston to face the Rockets in this one. And why do I not want to go on a Shangoon is being grossly mishandled rant tonight? Well, because it's massive, massive secondary news to James Harden's probable return to the lineup in his former stomping grounds. Yeah, James Harden is projected back in the saddle again for the Sixers. I will never do that again. But this just carries all the signs of a Sixers smash. Although... The books clearly don't entirely see it that way. Just six and a half points. I don't really see why that's the case. And I got a little bit nervous about seeing this kind of a number. I have this projected near minus nine, which would normally fall into the lock category. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait to see what happens with the James Harden news and make sure, make sure he's warming up, that he's good to go, that there's nothing wonky here. Because otherwise, I would absolutely be locking this one on the road. You get a healthy Joel Embiid back in the fray with his pick-and-roll partner. And I don't think people remember how good James Harden looked at the beginning of this season. I thought through the first week or two as Joel Embiid was playing himself back into game shape that James Harden was by far the better option to play through offensively on the Sixer side. Sure, they play way down in pace. Sure, they've had a neutral strength of schedule. But they're sixth in adjusted defensive rating. And I get it. You put James Harden on the floor. That's not going to be a plus in the defensive right. But they are 17th in adjusted offensive rating. That is very, very poor. They've played a lot of basketball with Embiid, Maxi, and Harden, so it makes sense. But with two of the three back and the core pieces uh, being the two of the three back, hard for me not to like. Minus six and a half here on the Philadelphia side. Super straightforward, super easy. And I will say, I would have slammed this one, but I want a little bit more information Maybe there's something that I'm missing here. Let me know in the comment section below if you're as wary as I am, because otherwise, I am all systems go on the Sixers side. We've got a back-to-back -back situation here for Memphis hosting the Heat. And the main thing to make note of here is Jimmy Butler is questionable for the Heat. And there are a lot of factors that are at play with him here. For one, the Heat are on the front leg of a back-to-back -back against the Grizzlies on Monday, and then they play the Pistons in Miami on Tuesday. Highly unlikely the coming off of injury and Jimmy Butler, just his crazy amounts of injuries over the course of his career. Highly unlikely he plays in both games. And considering this is the more competitive of the two, I would like to think that he's going to play Monday and rest Tuesday. That's just one man's assumption. I could be wrong, but I think the, the Heat are far more capable of winning without him at home against Detroit. I don't think that should surprise any of you. So I'm not breaking some historic news. Plus, just two and a half point dogs here. A lot of times this works out, especially with Memphis on the second leg of a back-to-back. -back. Uh, Steven Adams ended up sitting out and resting Sunday. Want to see what his status looks like. But everything for me has me leaning towards the Miami money line. Again, not really one that I can break down in any other way than John Morant. Are you going to play him on the back-to-back? -back? I would hope so. But maybe somebody else rests from the, from the uh, Memphis side. You can see Dylan Brooks, who's had a lot of injuries here of late, sit on the back-to-back. -back. That would be a downgrade to this team. Steven Adams being out again, that would be a downgrade to this team. Lots of ways where Miami would be the lean, but I'll wait to make this bet. I think we'll get some more information tomorrow. Jimmy Butler's news, huh? pretty damn important for this one. Ooh, it's the bad blood bowl here. This is the primetime event for me. If you're an NBA fan, you are jazzed up for this one. I know it's not the jazz playing, but Devin Booker and the Suns taking on Luka Doncic and the Mavericks. Anyone remember the NBA playoffs last year? Yeah, Booker was bragging and losing his mind. Oh, I'm so good. I'm so amazing. Until he went home to Phoenix, hosted a game seven. And Luka shushed him up real nice and good. A romping of biblical proportions. That was eloquent. That's the best way to put it, though. That's what happens when you lose by 50 at home in a Game 7. Looking forward to this one, especially because, you know, it's in Dallas. Sadly, we're still waiting on props here, so I'm forced to focus on totals and spreads. And hey, the total is pretty close. It's pretty close in play. 221.5. I'm kind of leaning that direction. But again, you're still without Chris Paul on the Phoenix side. He's got the Q tag. 
He isn't going to take the full... He didn't play on Sunday, I know, on the front end of this back-to-back. -back. We'll see if he can somehow, some way, suit up. There's no injury report out yet for Monday. Maybe coming off of the Game 7 loss, they want to try to make it work. But uh, for, for me right now, Dallas, we know that they play at the slowest pace in the entire NBA. We understand that Phoenix can be very, very solid defensively, even though without Cameron Johnson, without Jay Crowder on the team at all this entire season, uh, there can be some defensive inefficiencies at times. But uh, Mikhail Bridges, best of luck to you against Luka Doncic. I think he can do a decent enough job in some of these one-on-one -on -one scenarios, better than he did last year in the playoffs. <laughs> That's for sure. Probably put Devin Booker in the pick and roll and make him play some actual defense. But looking forward to it. I think the under is where I lean, but I will be paying very close attention to props, to spreads, to lots of other things here in this one. Until then, under 221 and a half, just a lean. And we have made it to our very last game of the night. It is the Pacers. It is the Golden State Warriors. And another spot where I'm kind of surprised there's a line out here. And here's why. Tyrese Halliburton sat on Sunday. TJ McConnell sat on Sunday. And let me just live check in because this is the one game that's going on in the association this evening. They're in the second quarter, the return of Damian Lillard, I must say. Miles Turner is out there lighting it up in the absence of Tyrese Alliburton, as one might expect. 17 and 6 so far with 224 left in the second quarter. But for me, I want Tyrese Halliburton on a floor if I'm going to be playing one of the best basketball teams in the entire association. And yeah, I'm putting that label next to Golden State because right now they are figuring things out. Andrew Wiggins knocking down over 40% from three. I want to throw up and pass out as a Timberwolves fan. I'm not okay. Check in on your fellow Timberwolves fans. We're not, we're, we're down bad right now, especially because Andrew Wiggins, can I repeat shooting 45% from three this season? God is not real. Like, God, this is not okay. Everything's bad. Everything's bad. But you know what? At least we can make money on these kind of things. I don't know if Tyrese Halliburton just sat out, but he was legitimately sick and questionable going into uh, the previous game on that Friday. I think coming into Sunday, everybody was kind of leaning towards him being out. But TJ McConnell, their backup point guard also being ruled out on Sunday. Maybe they just pumped this game entirely. And that brings a lot of interesting things into play. Like, I don't know. A lock button. Yes, a lock button on the minus nine and a half going Golden State's direction. If you take Tyrese Halliburton off the floor, this is a 13. You heard me. 13 point spread with TJ McConnell out as well. 13 and a half is kind of where my model is pointing this at. With Tyrese Halliburton in, it's still right around that nine and a half, 10, 10 number. So you are getting some massive kind of money to, to take that shot on the Golden State side. Draymond Green, Jordan Poole seem to be making nice, getting along. Things are good. And oh, I don't know, that Steph Curry fellow seems to be pretty decent. Jordan Poole could end up getting rested considering he's questionable coming into this one. But I think they're just waiting and seeing because if Tyrese Halliburton plays, they might just fire up everybody and call it a day. But if not, you could see some guys rest. And as long as Steph Curry is on this basketball floor, there is no way that I'm not firing minus nine and a half in the event that Tyrese Halliburton sits. Fire it up. It's the second lock. My favorite play on the board, Golden State, minus nine and a half. And that does it for another edition of Lindy's Leans, Lights, and Locks. You know what to do. Head to that video description box below. Uh, head to the comment section. Let me know your favorite plays on Monday's board. I'm sure you'll have a lot more information in terms of props. We had a couple of games that we're, uh, we're waiting on a little bit of news from, uh, massive news from the Clippers one. So be paying close attention to that. Check out all of the great content at Odd Shopper at Stochastic. Again, you want to be reacting to this news. That is how you get a massive, massive edge. And if you ever have questions, hit me up on Twitter at Eric Lindquist or comment section below. All righty, y'all. I'm out of here. Don't forget to sign up at DraftKings. Bet that $5 on Gonzaga. If you have not signed up yet, your best opportunity to get over at DraftKings and get yourself $150 of free play while you're at it. I'll be back Tuesday. I'm Eric Lindquist. Best of luck in the NBA streets on Monday.